Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Well, I've got good news. Today's the first Sunday in February. We're one step closer to spring. January's behind us. Hey, if you're here today and you're watching online, we want to take this opportunity to welcome you. We're so glad that you guys are here with us today. If you're here in the house, which you are, we're so thankful that you guys are here today too. And as Eric said, we're kicking off a brand new series, Intentional Family. And this month is going to be all about family. And in a culture where the importance of family is fading, we must remember that family is the core of the heart of God, both the nuclear family and the family of God. So whether you're single, whether you're dating, whether you're married, or simply trying to find your place in an over-sexualized or over-individualized culture, we are so glad that you're here because we're gonna spend this month looking to God's word to see how we can build intentional families. So the question is, what is it about families? Why are families so important? Why are families so important that we as a church would put the word family in the name of our church, Valley Family Church? Well, families are important because families are important to God, amen? And families are the foundation on which society is built upon. The values of a family are ultimately reflected in society at large. And the family is considered the core of society because it's the place where its members are most personally affected. It's the easiest place to instill values and to create change. Additionally, God has designed families as the first source of spiritual training and preparation for life. The family is supposed to provide the physical, the emotional, the social, the economical, and the spiritual needs of its members. You know, I'm here to tell you that merely paying the bills and just surviving is not God's plan for the family. Maintaining a relationship just for the sake of having a comfort of a relationship is not God's plan for the family. Just keeping life going, the humdrum of everyday life, the ins and the outs, the laundry, the groceries, the cleaning of the house, the going to work, the getting the kids to school, that's not God's chief plan for families. It's not merely enough to have fun and enjoy each other's company for a lifetime. That's good. That's all great, but it's not God's plan for the family. And unfortunately, these are the very things that so many families get bogged down in. But God has a higher purpose for families. And the key word there in that statement is higher purpose. And so I want everyone to repeat those words with me. Higher purpose. You see, God's desire for the family is to produce spiritually and emotionally mature human beings who in turn get the work of God done on the earth. You see, building strong families, it doesn't just happen. They're the result of deliberate determination, practice, and intentionality. Now, today is February 6th. And how many of you all know what holiday we're gonna be celebrating in just eight days? Valentine's Day, that's right. And this morning, as you came in, you received a chocolate heart. Did you not? Yeah, you got it? Okay, you may have thought that that chocolate heart was just simply a Valentine's Day gift from us to you. But it's beyond that, it's more than that, because you received that chocolate heart this morning as a token to help you remember what we're talking about at least until you eat it, amen? (laughs) But I brought two chocolate hearts myself this morning as an illustration. Now, these hearts that I have here, they're both the same shape. They're roughly the same size. They're the same color. They're the same, they smell the same. They taste the same. Both of these hearts cost about $10. (laughs) Inflation, right? They came wrapped in foil, 
But you see, these hearts are very different. And when you look at these hearts, it may be very difficult to tell the difference between these two hearts until pressure is applied. Because you see, this heart is hollow. And when you apply pressure, look what happens. The heart cracks. It falls apart. This heart, when you apply the same amount of pressure, nothing happens because it's solid. You see, there are parallels to the family. You know, some families, they crack and break when the pressures of life are applied. But other families, families with a solid foundation, when the pressures of life are applied, guess what? They don't crack. They don't fall apart because they're not hollow. They're solid. So what is that solid foundation of strong families? It's Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says this. It says, he, speaking of Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they are kings or lords, rulers or powers, Everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything and holds everything together. You see, only in Christ can we truly build solid families. You know, the world, the world will work overtime to pull your family apart. But Jesus will hold your family together. You see, families, they are close to the heart of God. In fact, they were God's idea in the first place. God's plan for family began in the book of Genesis. It wasn't an afterthought. From the very beginning, when God created man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so what did he do? He created woman. They were the first power couple. Then he blessed them and he told them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And even after they sinned, God continued with his plan for families. He spoke prophetically of the salvation that would come through the seed of woman. And so often, you know, when we read our Bibles, we skip over the genealogies. We skip them completely. I mean, First Chronicles, you know, the first nine books of First Chronicles. The, the, the first nine chapters, they're filled with names that we can't even pronounce, right? And it's so easy to skip over them. But you know, those names, those names represent individuals. And they represent families. And if you were to study those genealogies, and if you were to follow those genealogies out, you'll see that the promise of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was passed from one generation to the next. Families are important. Later, after the flood, God reiterated his plan to Noah and his sons. And he told them to be fruitful and to multiply and to refill the earth. God continued his plan when he chose Abraham and he miraculously gave him a son in his old age. And he told him that he would be the father of of many nations. And so it goes all the way down to what the Bible calls the fullness of time when God sent his son, Jesus, to come in human flesh and to live and to die for the very people he created. God had a plan for families from the very first book, the book of Genesis. Now, let's fast forward to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'll set the stage here for you. You see, between Genesis and Deuteronomy 6, God calls Abraham. He gives him the promise that he will be the father of many nations. And as a result, the nation of Israel is born, right? And this nation of Israel, they go into captivity. They spend 400 years in slavery, in captivity in Egypt. And then God calls Moses to deliver the nation of Israel out of captivity. 
Moses finally obeys the Lord, and he approaches Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, and he says, let my people go. But Pharaoh refused. He refused to let the people of Israel go because Egypt needed their slave labor. And so the plagues began. And finally, Pharaoh agreed, and Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and into the desert wilderness. Now, some historians say that this group of people numbered more than two million people. Two million people consisting of fathers and mothers and sons and daughters and grandfathers and grandmothers. And God was faithful to these families. God provided a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He provided manna from heaven every morning and quails every night for the people of Israel to eat. And then the children of Israel approached the border of the promised land, a land that the Bible described as flowing with milk and honey. And yet, they refused to go in. And as a result, they spent 40 additional years wandering in the wilderness until that entire generation had passed away. And now, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the nation of Israel is on the border of the promised land. They're just about to enter in, and they're going to face one of the most intimidating challenges that they have ever faced. Which, if you think about it, that's pretty amazing. I mean, they saw some pretty amazing things, did they not? They crossed the Red Sea with the Egyptian army behind them, chasing them, because Pharaoh had a change of heart. And what happened? The Red Sea collapses behind them, and it washes away the entire Egyptian army. And yet, they find themselves on the edge of the promised land, facing the most intimidating challenge that they have ever faced. Because you see, they're getting ready to enter into a pagan land. They have to penetrate a pagan culture, a culture that does not recognize God, does not recognize the scriptures, does not recognize absolute truth on any level. Does that culture sound familiar? sounds a lot like the culture that we're living in today. And this is the culture that the Israelites are getting ready to enter. And here in Deuteronomy 6, we see entire families all on the edge of this enemy territory. And they're about to invade Jericho to conquer the land that the Lord has given them. And once they conquer it, they're to settle it. They're to settle into the land and lead normal lives. But you see, God knows that as they settle in, if they're not careful, they'll get comfortable and they'll forget about him. They'll become indifferent and they'll forget all that the Lord has done. So to prepare them, Moses takes them aside and he reminds them of the essentials, the basics, if you will, of how to have a solid faith. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses instructs the Israelites. This is what he says. He says, now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, and you and your sons and your grandsons all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, Moses addressed the family. In verse 2, he gives instructions to the fathers, the sons, the grandsons. God was interested in families then, and he's interested in families now. He wants parents and children and grandchildren to live lives, to be fruitful, to multiply. He wants us to appropriate all of the promises of the blessings of God's word and live the blessed life, spirit, soul, and body. And Moses goes on to say this in verse 4. He says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but this statement, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, is a very important statement to the Jewish people. And it's the first of four guiding principles for building strong, intentional Christian families in a post-Christian culture. If we're going to have strong, intentional Christian families, then we and our children need to hear continually. That statement, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, is called the Shama for the Jewish people. And it's from the word that's translated to mean to hear. What did they need to hear? They needed to hear that their God was the one true God. You see, they were entering into a pagan world full of pagan gods. This land that they were entering into had family gods. It had neighborhood gods. It had national gods. But none of them were the real God. They were all idols that were made by man. So when a stronger nation invaded, they were conquered because none of these gods could protect them. Their God didn't have the strength to protect them because their God was the little g God. And Moses was instructing the Israelites, and it was important for them to know that their God wasn't just one of many little g gods, but Israel's God was the only God, the one and only capital G God, and that he would be faithful to keep his promises. This verse here, hear, O Israel, that the Lord is one, this verse is still said three times a day by practicing Jews. And so to build solid, intentional families, we must hear the truth continually. How many of you have read that childhood story, The Little Engine Who Could? You ever read that story? What does he say? What does that little engine say as he's going up the steep hill? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Why did he have to keep saying, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can, as he went up that steep hill? Because he needed to believe it. And in order for him to believe it, he needed to hear it. He needed to hear it repeatedly. He's a little engine with a big load on a steep hill. That same principle is true today. If we're going to succeed in life, if we're going to build intentional families, we have to continually hear the word. Our kids, our grandkids need to hear these words that our God, he is the Lord. He is the one and only God. We must trust him without any second thoughts. There's no one more reliable. I mean, if you think about it, the word tells us that Jesus is the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the way, the truth, the life, and there is no other way to the Father except through Jesus. Families that hear that truth continually are like that solid chocolate heart. When the pressures of life come and squeeze them, they don't break or crack because they're not hollow. The second principle for building strong, intentional families is to love the Lord passionately. Moses goes on to say in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. What word do you hear over and over in that verse? The word all. Our love for Jesus has to be all-encompassing. It has to be total, not partial, not just when it's convenient. This love, it's not about religion. It has nothing to do with religion. In fact, this type of love can only occur within the context of a relationship with Jesus Christ. God wants a complete love from us because he loves us completely. And we love him because he first loved us. And when we love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, we esteem him. 
We delight in him. We place our faith and our trust in him. We worship him. We are obedient to him. We give him the first place trophy of our heart. And why is this so important in the context of family? Because it's impossible for us to help a child catch something that we haven't caught ourselves. I've, I've heard it said this way, you can't pass a torch that's not lit in your own life. You see, if the sincerity of your passionate love for Christ isn't solidly demonstrated in your actions, it will sound hollow coming off your lips. This covenant commitment to love the Lord your God must intentionally be instilled within the fabric and the DNA of our families. But it has to start with us. The third principle for building strong, intentional families is to teach the young diligently. Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9 says this. It says, you shall teach them diligently, speaking of the scriptures, the word of God, to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You see, God's desire is that there is a constant, consistent transfer of his truth from one generation to the next. It's been said that Christianity is always one generation away from extinction. Psalms 127.3 says, Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. And you know, in the parable of the talents, Jesus makes it pretty clear, doesn't he, that we are expected to do something with the gifts that are entrusted to us. And so following that same reason, if kids really are a gift from the Lord, as the scriptures say, then we have a responsibility to teach them about the things of God. We need to do our part to help keep the faith alive in their hearts and their minds for Jesus. And as Christian parents and mentors, we need to find every opportunity possible to help teach kids about God. And as a church, you know, we want to partner with you as a parent to help teach your kids about God. That's why we place such intentional emphasis on kids' ministry at VFC. That's why we included the name fa family in the middle of our church name, right? And I'll put a plug in right now. Uh, beginning February 20th, We'll be offering Basics 101, getting a grip on the basics for kids every Sunday night for eight weeks at six o'clock. I encourage you, get your elementary age kids in that class because it will help establish a foundation of faith in their life that they can live from their entire life. But the key word there is help. You see, our job as a church is to help you as parents. It's not our responsibility to solely be the communicators of the faith to children. I mean, if you do the math, if you think about it, on average in kids' ministry, we have your kids for roughly 90 minutes a week. 90 minutes. A week consists of 168 hours. So do the math. How much time do we have your kids, and how much time do you have your kids? It's our job as a church to come alongside you and to partner with you. But as parents, our kids need to learn about God through the examples that we set. The frequency in which we read our Bibles. You know, and as a family, we're not a perfect family. We didn't raise perfect kids. But we did do some things intentionally, on purpose. And one of those things that we did was reading the Bible. We read the Bible as a family. We did devos with our kids. And now, we did something different with each kid. We have two kids. We have a boy and a girl. Camden is our oldest, and you know, for him, he's a morning person, so mornings worked. And we adopted the concept that we've heard Pastor Jeff talk about before, the Big Daddy Bistro concept, 
where we had a hot breakfast waiting on the table every morning before school. And every morning before school, we did a Devo, we read a verse from the Bible, and we prayed. That worked for him. Kennedy, our daughter, she's not a morning person. So we had to find other times and other ways to get our Bible reading and our Devos in with her. But one thing that was consistent is that we were intentional about making God's word a priority. Our kids need to see and hear how often we pray. They need to see what kind of emphasis that we place on attending church. Now, our kids, both of our kids just so happened to be born on a Sunday. And they were in church the very next Sunday. And they've been in church almost every Sunday since. And the question growing up was never if we were going to church. It was always, what time are we leaving? And how many services are we going to? <laughs> now, you might say, but yeah, that's, that, 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 that's all good and fine. Your kids are PKs. And, and that is true. Our kids are PKs. But it was never about being a PK. It was about being a Christian. When our kids were little, we had services Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, three times a week. And we were at all of them as a family. Yeah, but, but what about their bedtimes? I mean, you know, they've got schedules, they've got schedules, there's dinner at a certain time, they've got to be in bed at a certain time. You know what? We put them to bed when we got home from church. And then as parents, we exercised our faith that God could supernaturally make up any sleep that they missed. That when they put their heads down in their cribs after being at church at night, you know what? That God would bless their sleep and it would be sweet and they would wake up and they would be in a better mood because they had been in the house of God and we had put God first place in their lives. Amen? Our kids, amen, yeah, if you're gonna clap, clap. Our kids need to see how we spend our money. It's our responsibility to teach them about tithes and offering, what the tithe is. Why do we give to God? They need to see the words we use, or more importantly, the words we don't use. They need to be able to hear the tones in which we speak the words that we use. They need to see what we watch on TV, the music we listen to, how we react in rush hour traffic. Because <laughs> here's what I can tell you. Our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors, they teach our kids something every moment of every day. Not only are we to teach our kids about God, we're to talk about him. Now, we don't need to lecture our kids. Because what happens when we lecture our kids? This happens when we lecture our kids. Right? We all know it. We've all seen it. When we lecture our kids, we get the eyes rolled, the body slumped, the arms crossed, the heads cocked back, right? We all know what that's like. But we can't impress upon them or teach them by lecturing them. We simply need to talk to our kids about God. Talk to them about God just like we would talk about anything else. We talk about sports, we talk about movies. We talk about TVs, we talk about the day we had at school, we talk about what we're having for dinner. We usually have that conversation every day. It usually goes something like, so what are we having for dinner tonight? I don't know, what do you want? I don't care, what sounds good? All right, it's very natural. It's very much a give and take, an easy flow. Those things all come easy. One thing that we did with our kids is we drove them to school every day. Why? so we could talk to them, so we could pray for them and with them. And on the way to school every day, we took the opportunity to make a confession of faith about their day and about their school year. Every day. Every day. Year after year after year, we repeated the same confession. Every single day, we said, this year will be my best year yet. As I go to school, I am full of joy, life, love, 
and boldness. I have the mind of Christ. I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I am a leader for God's kingdom every day. I am anointed to learn, to make friends, and to be the best student that I can be. God is with me, he is for me, and he is on my side. I am successful and prospering and blessed. I will be a world changer in my school, in my sports teams, and in my group of friends. This year is going to be my very best year ever. We said that every day, Monday through Friday, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, even their senior year, we didn't let them drive themselves to school <laughs> because we wanted to spend time with them. We wanted to talk to them. We wanted to have this opportunity. And when we started, it started with me saying the confession and them repeating it. But you know, it wasn't too long before they could say the confession and I could agree with it. And I dare say that if you ask Camden and Kennedy today what that confession is, they could repeat it because it's in their heart. So what are we talking about? We're talking about talking about God, just like we talk about anything else. And it shouldn't just happen on Sunday. We're going to be intentional about building solid Christian families it should happen on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it doesn't just happen when we're putting them to bed, but all the time. Now, it doesn't have to be weird, right? It can be very natural. But just talk to your kids about the goodness and faithfulness of God. The fourth principle for building strong, intentional families is to fear the Lord greatly. So what does it exactly mean to fear the Lord? Because there can be some confusion with this concept because we interpret the meaning of the context in the context of our human experience of fearing something, something like a storm or, or a tragic event. But to better understand the meaning of this verse, take the word fear and replace it with other words like respect or honor or reverence. We are to reverence the Lord. We're to respect the Lord. We're to honor the Lord. One good definition of fearing the Lord is this. It is to have a wholesome dread of displeasing him. Billy Graham talking about this concept was quoted as saying, to fear God is not to shrink back from him in terror. To fear God is to have a deep reverence for him and to stand in awe at his holiness and majesty and power and love. Only then will we love and serve and worship him as we should. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which is why Moses was reiterating all of this to the children of Israel before they crossed over into the promised land. Let's look at Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 15. It says, so it shall be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, when you have eaten and are full, then beware lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear or honor, or esteem, or reverence the Lord your God, and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you, and destroy you from the face of the earth. You see, the children of Israel, they were getting ready to walk into the blessings of God. They were about to enter into the promised land. They were leaving manna and quail for milk and honey. They were about to settle into a new way of life and enjoy lands and cities and homes and vineyards. And Moses knew that they, like us, when everything is going well and when life is good, would be tempted to forget about God. 
God didn't say that they couldn't walk in the blessings, but he did warn them not to forget about him in the midst of the blessings. And one of the ways that you don't forget is to teach your kids to recognize the blessing and be grateful for them. You see, the challenge is not to just walk in the blessings of God, but to remember the source of the blessings. So families, they're important to God. They're the foundation on which society is built. Godly families that are spiritually, emotionally, physically, and socially healthy produce those kind of peoples. The saying is true, like begets like. And when the family unit is strong and healthy, the members of the family can individually and collectively accomplish God's plan on the earth. You see, through the ages, God's plan and desire has always been for parents to raise up children who know him and love him and walk in his ways. But in order for that to happen, we have to be intentional ourselves to hear the truth continually, to love the Lord passionately, to teach the young diligently, and to fear the Lord greatly. Amen? Amen. Now, you might be wondering, okay, how does this apply if your kids are grown up or you don't have children of your own? Well, God still has a plan and a purpose for you, a part, for, for you as a part of his family through faith in Christ. You can fulfill his plan to be fruitful and multiply as you give yourself to his kingdom by being a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, a spiritual brother, a spiritual sister. But in order to do kingdom work, Jesus must first be the king of your heart. It all begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in John 3.16 that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe upon him would not perish but would have eternal life. It goes on to say in verse 17, for God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. And here's what I can tell you this morning. God's crazy mad in love with you. He loves you. He wants to have a covenant relationship with you. He wants to come into your life and save you and give you the power and the ability to walk out all of these blessings of God in your life. But it all starts with a relationship with him. It's a matter of just simply going on record before God and saying, Jesus, I need you. So I want to take this opportunity before we go today to ask you for just a moment to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the personal Lord and Savior of your life, and you want to do that today, then I simply want to ask you to raise your hand. Just want you to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Because in just a moment, we're going to say a prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart. All right, so if you would, why don't you repeat this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now in Jesus' name, and I admit my need for a Savior. The Bible says that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, that I would be saved. Jesus, I confess you now as my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. Amen.